we've come together to discuss social media as it pertains to the minister, right? And so as we discuss that, what? To the minister. To the minister and all of you are ministers, whether you are ordained or not. You are all ministers because you are all called to minister the gospel, right? Okay. All called to be ministers of the church. And so then we come together to talk about this because social media is the way that everyone communicates. And so you have this question, should the church engage or should the church stand at the sidelines? And in our society, many things become the devil, right? <laughs> many things become the devil. And as the devil, they are subsequently cast aside by the church. <coughs> so should social media be one of those things? I remember when uh, hip-hop came on the scene, everybody said, hip-hop is the devil. <laughs> and so the church had nothing to do with hip-hop, but as you see, hip-hop didn't go anywhere, and now hip-hop culture pervades society, and the church is nowhere to be found, and so the only voices that are in hip-hop are those that you may not want to hear except for those that you can't hear because the noise of the ones that you don't want to hear is too loud. So will that happen for us with social media? Will we stand on the sidelines and say we're not going to get involved, the church shouldn't be there because it is the devil, and will 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now we be looking back and see that everything is being done on social media and exactly, except for us. <laughs> And so how should the church engage social media? How should ministers, understanding that we are all ministers, whether we wear a collar or not, how should we engage social media? This is what this presentation is about. How can the social media be applied for ministers? And so we live in a high-tech society. We live in a high-tech society with high-tech youth. And what we have with these youth is People who have no idea of a world without Facebook. Facebook has been around for 10 years now. No idea of a world without Facebook. Certainly no idea of a world without the internet. If you can get back to those who don't remember the internet, you can't find those who have no conscience of a computer. And I remember when I got my first computer, it was a Commodore 64. Y'all remember the Commodore 64? Yeah. When, when floppy disks were floppy, <laughs> and when people even used disks. People don't use disks anymore. Have no clue what a disk is. But even if you get to somebody who cannot understand a computer, where is the person who has no conscience of what a smartphone is? <laughs> If you see somebody who opens up their phone and it flips like this. <laughs> you, you, you look at them as if they are some sort of dinosaur. Where did they come from? Do they still make you? So why social media? What do the numbers say? Well, 93% of both teens and young adults are online. Of those 93% of teens and young adults who are online, 73% of those use Facebook. So that means that just about everybody is online using Facebook. Right now, of course, for the dinosaurs, there are the dangers. And so we talk about how you get online and people have all sorts of access to your personal information. And if you remember most recently around Christmas time, they talked about Target and Nordstrom and that whole scandal where people were having their credit card information stripped and so on and so forth and everything was run amok. And then you have your exposure to your private thoughts. And so, you know, you tell people, be careful what you post online. Why? Because when you are job hunting, when you are applying for college, when you are doing all of those things and they look online and they see that inappropriate selfie, 
<laughs> you might have a few problems finding a job. But if that wasn't enough, then we have the cyberbullying and other sorts of abuse that take place online where people are experiencing all sorts of ills. Used to be you get bullied at school and you come home, you cry to mama and she, you know, she rubs your back and once she hears that story enough, she sends you with a broomstick back outside and tells you don't come home until you deal with the bully. Well, now that bully has access to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when you thought that it was only your school or your classmates who were being exposed to the vile things that that bully was saying, that bully can now go online and expose it to Lord knows whoever, how many people, right? But with every danger, there is opportunity. And so Philippians 4 through 4, chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians 4, 8 says, Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Admirable. Think on those things, right? We, we got all of these things that are bad, but fix your thoughts on what are true and honorable and all of those things. So fixing our thoughts on those things, we see that social media presents a window to the soul. You know, back when, even when I was growing up, and certainly before I was growing up, there was this place called The Stoop. And that's where all of the neighborhood stories were told. It was told on The Stoop or on The Corner. And you would have those doo-wop kids that are out there singing and talking about what was going on. And even when hip-hop was still on The Corner, they'd be rapping about what's going on. It ain't The Stoop or The Corner anymore. <laughs> Used to be that in families, these stories were told at the fireside as you sat around the, the, the fireplace telling family stories or, you know, the little girls or whatnot would have their sleepovers and they would tell the stories and talk about things that were going on. It ain't that no more either. <laughs> the new storytelling venue is the internet. That is the new storytelling venue. And so, we look at social media and the Great Commission. And we know the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And so, go and make disciples of all the nations. And so, keeping that in mind, we talk about the social media nation. With 93% of all teens and young adults online and 73% of them on Facebook, and we know that several billion people are members of Facebook, we can consider Facebook to be a nation, right? So what does this online nation or these online nations look like? Within Facebook, you have a couple things to remember. You have fan pages. Now, fan pages, of course, is where you have, just like a little fan club. Remember, you used to have a fan club, and people used to have to write letters and send to their fan club, and every now and again, the person that you were a fan club of would send something out to you as well. And you had that, well, those fan clubs are now online, and they're called fan pages on Facebook, so if you're a fan of somebody, they might, they send out stuff about what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're up to, so on and so forth, and you have a chance to post on their wall, oh, I just love <laughs> or do whatever it is that you want to do to express how big of a fan you are. You also have something called Facebook groups. Facebook groups are different in the in defense that you can control who is and who is not a part of that group. Once you have a fan page up, you can't control who likes it or who dislikes it. You can do some things to kind of control who can say what and, and what can be said, but you have no control over who likes it or who does not like it, right? With a group, you can control the environment a little bit more. You can control who's allowed entrance. You can even control whether or not that group will be seen. For our church, we have a secret group, and I advertise it in the bulletin to let parents know it is secret. You can't just go and find it. You have to be invited or you have to know the link in order to get there, and then once you get there, you have to be approved to be, to be admitted. 
so that parents can understand that if their children are in our Facebook group, it is a controlled environment where we know what's going on. In your church, do you have multiple groups? Not right now, we just have, I, I've started the first fan page and first group from our church, so it's something where I'm getting people acclimated. Okay. As we get more people engaged, then we'll be able to segment it more. Okay. But there's no sense in segmenting it when you have like two people, three people, ten people <laughs> on your group. I mean, what are you segmenting, you know? <laughs> Everybody's going to be in the various segments. So, you know, as I, because it's mainly, it's mainly the youth that are on there now, so I have no need for a youth group versus an adult group. When I get more of the adults on there, then I'll segment it and have an adult group and a youth group, okay. right? So Facebook, that's Facebook. And you also have what we call Twitter, not the Twitter, just Twitter. And Twitter is different. Twitter is, um, it's a little harder to interact on Twitter because everything just kind of flies by and goes out there. But it's a place, and Twitter, as we looked up earlier, has about 645 million plus um, users on it. And then we also have the other behemoth, which is YouTube. And YouTube, after Google, is the largest search engine, because everybody goes on YouTube. You've got a billion plus people on YouTube, using YouTube, watching videos, looking at videos, so on and so forth. So there, within YouTube, they also have something now that they've developed called Google Hangouts, right? And Google Hangouts is like video conferencing for free. So you can go on Google Hangouts, and right now I do my Bible studies on Google Hangouts. I do confirmation class on Google Hangouts. So, I, you know, because most of us Episcopalians, we have commuter churches where people don't live in the neighborhoods anymore, so they may or may not make it to church on a Sunday. Or if you have a Bible study in the evening, they may or may not be able to come to Bible study regularly. So this gives them a way to participate online. I can see them, they can see me, they can be a part of the class live. And even if they missed it, a Google Hangout is recorded and posted to YouTube, and they can go back after the fact and look at it online. Is there a free they control? That's free. The same as a go to meeting? Yes, but for free. Are they controlled as to who has access? You can. You can set it private or you can set it public. So, once you understand the nation, right, now we're talking about branding and becoming part of the nation. Branding is important because branding is ultimately how you will be identified in the nation. Uh, my church will start to understand, and they have seen it, that they, will, that they always see we've changed our website to Orlando Forerunner from, from the vague you know, stjeps.org, that you have no clue what that is, <laughs> to Orlando Forerunner. St. John the Baptist is the forerunner, so we are the forerunner for Orlando, Orlando Forerunner. It becomes something that can stick. So wherever we are, wherever you go, you'll see Orlando Forerunner, you start to know. When it's on YouTube, when it's on Facebook, when it's on Twitter, Orlando Forerunner, you know what that is. You also notice on the background of the slides, everything says Job Brett. That's my personal brand. So everything that I do says job bread. So it becomes identifiable. People begin to associate that branding with your entity. And so it becomes important on how you brand it. So what will be your brand? And in branding, you will begin to become part of the nation. Now as you become part of the nation, as far as becoming part of any nation, you have to learn the national language. Now, what is the national language of this social media nation? We have different things. We have status updates, right? Status updates are where you get a chance to post your thoughts, post your questions, post your concerns. Status updates more so happen or more pertinent on Facebook, right? And Facebook allows you, you can post a status update pretty long. They shouldn't be terribly long because nobody's got time to read all of that. Social media is about quick. But they're not limited in terms of how long you can post them. When you're looking at your status updates or the status updates of others, you'll see that there is also something called a share. Right? You have the opportunity to share things. So somebody can see something on your page 
and they like what you said and they want to share it with their network, right? So they have the opportunity to click the share button and it goes on their page. And vice versa, if you see something on someone else's page that is pertinent or, 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 or appeals to your network, you may choose to share it on your page. What that does is you're building connectivity. You want to build relationships when you're online, right? It's a, just like in person, you want to build relationships. It's the same sort of thing online. You want to build relationships, and so you want to find ways to build relationships. Another way to do that is tagging. And tagging is your direct share. So, for instance, I have something that I'm saying on my personal page that I know is about communications, how to communicate. Here we are talking about communications. And I, I see something that talks about, that I'm talking about how to communicate. Joe Toma, the communications director, he, I know he's going to be interested in stuff about communications. In addition to that, there's a large likelihood that the people he's connected to are also going to be interested in communication. So I may tag him in a particular post. And what that does is it puts it on his wall, and so he sees it, and his network sees it. So now you're expanding your reach into other people's circles. How does that work? So now you have, you have little Johnny at, at your, in your youth group, and little Johnny is on a football team. Now, you don't have anybody else that plays football in your church, but little Johnny does play football, and he's pretty good. And so you know little Johnny has a whole bunch of friends that plays football. Now, something comes out, and you watch an ESPN 60 for 30 for 30 or whatever, and they, uh, out, outside the lines or whatever, and there's this report that comes out about football and concussions and so on and so forth, and something tweaks in you theologically, spiritually, about football that you feel like saying. Now you tag little Johnny because you know this is pertinent for football. If I just put it out there, that's for everybody to see. Little Johnny may see it, little Johnny may not see it. If I tag little Johnny, it will be on little Johnny's page, he will definitely see it. In addition to that, those of his friends who are also interested in football will see it. Now, hopefully, what happens? They see it, and you've said something very thought-provoking, very compassionate, very whatever, and they're like, little Johnny, who's that? Oh, that's one of the members from my church, or that's one of my that's my pastor, or that's my priest, or whatever. Oh man, that was that was good. I'd like to meet that person someday. Now little Johnny has an avenue to be talking to other people about your church and about what you're doing at your church, and maybe getting people from your to come to your church from his circle. Right? When you have tagging, you also have likes. Now likes are kind of problematic. <laughs> You know, I kind of wish there was a unlike button or a not like button or, you know, because you see all kind of things on there nowadays. And, and, and we want to be responsible members of this nation to be able to keep the nation on track. We want to be responsible members of this nation. And so when you see somebody post that I just lost my grandmother, don't click the like button. <laughs> What we use like for now in the nation, what many people are using like for is an acknowledgement that they see what you said. But the button is like. <laughs> and when you click it, it says that you have X number of likes. So you could end up with something like, just lost my grandmother today and it's got 50 likes. Why in the world do 50 people like the fact that I lost my grandmother? <laughs> So we want to be responsible members of this nation and model good behavior in this nation. And so if you want to acknowledge somebody that said something that's, that you shouldn't really like, acknowledge it by saying something, by commenting on their post, on their status update, rather than just clicking like. Tweet. Now, tweets are complicated, for, especially for somebody like myself who's very verbose. I use a lot of words. But tweets limit you to 140 characters. Yes. So it forces you to put on your thinking cap. <laughs> what do I really want to say? What do I really have to say? And then that's when you start seeing, I know y'all see the kids with all of these LOLs and 
uh, RTFOL and you know uh, whatever IMHO and you know so on and so forth. That's where you start getting all of these abbreviations. Yeah. You know, so instead of saying before B E F O R E, I'll just put a B and a four. You know, because yeah, before. Or instead of saying uh, straight S T R A I G H T, I'll just put S T R number eight. Straight. <laughs> You start finding creative ways to shorten down your, your words and whatnot because it forces you to be to the point. It forces you to be bottom line on top. Get to the point, say what you want to say, and hopefully direct people to what you want to say. Right? The way for Twitter interacting, you don't, you don't really have friends, you have followers. And so you can follow anyone, anyone can follow you. They don't have to approve you to follow them. You don't have to approve them. So whatever you say on Twitter is going to be seen. And whatever you see on Twitter is available to everybody. So whereas with your Facebook page, you can kind of limit who's going to see what on your own personal page. On your Twitter page, don't say nothing you don't want anybody else to see. Because it's, it's going to be out there, I promise you. And I, if, I, if I search for something, I can find your tweet. Is that the same as the, the fan page? Yeah. In the yeah. sense, in the sense that you cannot control who who follows you, yes. Because with a fan page, you cannot control who likes it. Right. With a, with your Twitter, you cannot control who follows you. So in that sense, it is the same. Within tweets, you have retweets, right? And a retweet is when uh, you see somebody else a tweet. A retweet is kind of like a share. Right? So you see somebody else's tweet and you really like what they said, right? You can retweet it to your followers. Or you say something that is really thought provoking or whatever and somebody else likes it, they can retweet it to their followers. Right? You can tag similar ways. So if um, I know Father Tom's Twitter handle and I'm saying something that I want him and his followers to see, I can tag Father Tom in my tweet. And hopefully he'll retweet it. Hopefully he'll see it and he'll say, oh, I like that. And I'll retweet it. Right? Because the goal is always connectivity, building relationship. How do you expand your presence? Because this is also a tool by which you get out there so that ultimately more people can come in in the real world. Right? So within Twitter also you have something called favorites. Favorites is like liking. So as a like is on, 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 on Facebook, a favorite is to Twitter. The difference with favorites is not necessarily as bad as like where you like something that really shouldn't be liked. A favorite is like, you know, this is, this is my favorite, this is one of my favorite tweets that I've seen. So it could be something bad, but the person said it in a way that was really on target, right? That becomes a favorite. So when it look when you and, when, and you, the more favorites you have of your tweets, the more retweets you have of your tweets, the more people see your tweets, the more people interact with you, the more followers you start to get, right? So how do we put this all together? How do we set up shop? Remember, I'm saying to you, the goal is that you are building community, all right? When we talk about emergent church, we talk about that a lot, right? I'm one of those uh, orthodox people that I believe the liturgy is the liturgy. We don't mess with the liturgy. The emergent church is emerging, goes out into the world, and brings people back to the liturgy. But we engage, we build community, we emerge, and one of the ways of emerging is social media, right? So we get out there to build community. And so when you're building community, what you're looking for is you want to have more friends. That's Facebook specific. You want to have more fans. That's Facebook specific. You want to have more followers. That's Twitter specific. You want to have more subscribers. 
That's YouTube specific, right? Now, when you have these people, you don't just have them just for the sake of having them. You want these people, you have these people because you ultimately want to engage. It's a way to engage, right? And engagement is not one-sided. Uh, Father Rob talked about it earlier in his presentation. A fan page, a Twitter page, it's not just like public announcements. Where you, where you put out messages talking about come to our fish fry or, you know, come to Holy Eucharist or, you know, come do this or come do that. But you're engaging with meaningful content, right? And so the thing that I like to say is be audacious, right? Be audacious. Remember that Jesus Christ was an audacious individual. He was not meek and mild and timid and all of those things that we like to say. Jesus Christ was, was audacious. So be audacious. And it's about, like they say, what they say, location, location, location. <laughs> it's about content, content, content. If you have a Twitter page or a Facebook page or whatever for your church and they only post something once a week, I'm not going to get it. What, what, what am I doing with that? And if I'm not interested enough to post on it, why in the world would somebody else be interested enough to look at it? Content, content, content. Let me give you some examples of what we're talking about when we talk about building community, right? Facebook. I said I have my own branding. You look at my Facebook site. That's my Facebook fan page. This is to show you that what I'm talking about can happen. You see here, the bottom circle, for my fan page, 4,000, that says 84, it's now up to like 90 something fans. Now, so that means when I go on my Facebook fan page and I'm posting my thoughts, posting my questions, interacting, I ultimately post my sermons, whatever I'm doing, I'm showing it not just to 4,000 people, but I'm putting it in 4,000 people's network. So your ultimate reach, my ultimate reach is in the hundreds of thousands. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about getting exposure for our congregations, right? So that your congregation can now be in a, in a place where it can reach thousands and thousands of people, right? When we look at Twitter, Again, I say branding, you notice, job red, everything, job red. I'm a little higher again, but you'll see 1,400 followers on Twitter, right? And I want to say something else in terms of being audacious, which falls in line with why, even though I'm in my clericals, my clerical collar, I'm not in the, in the normal shirt and tie or shirt and pants or whatever. I come, I come to, to speak with you all, knowing who you all are, in my Bob Marley Lion t-shirt. <laughs> right? Be audacious. And so, if you look at my picture, I'm not in a collar. I got a dinner jacket on, my bow tie hanging open, and I got a glass of whiskey. I'm a good Episcopalian. A glass of whiskey <laughs> in my hand. Why? Because, yes, it says priest in there, right? But a lot of times, people have a hard time talking with a priest. Because when they think of priest, they think of Catholic. And when they think of that, they think of all kinds of God knows what. But at the same time, when they, when they think of that, we have this veneer that we put up when we're talking to clergy. But if you can see that he knows how to cut loose, she knows how to cut loose, whatever, you build a comfort zone where you're approachable now. Right? And so that guy may not be that bad, you know? My parents told me I needed to talk to a priest, and I never really wanted to talk to them other folk, because they always look so stiff or whatever. But, you know, that guy might not be so bad. YouTube. Again, job rep. And you'll see the branding. And you notice subscribers, 1,246. So, when I have my videos, for a while I was doing some daily Bible study videos. I have a couple hundred videos online. <coughs> There's over a thousand people that see those videos, right? And can share those videos. Now, churches are doing something every week. 
you have more than enough content to be producing videos. And the technology is easy. I don't know if Father Rob brought it this time, the, uh, the camera. I didn't bring it this time. Okay, but you can get some, some little tiny Wi-Fi cameras. They're like $300. You know, even if you want to, you can record video off your, your, your smartphone. There is always something that you can be doing to produce content, to produce videos. And even if not, if all else fails, you can create content for your YouTube page using other people's videos. You can become one of those places where you curate videos of, okay, great sermons or, you know, you know, the best cat videos <laughs> <laughs> or whatever else. And people know that I'm going to go to their YouTube page because they always have the best, you know, meditational moments or whatever. It might not be your own, but you've gone online and you spent time pulling together the best content, aggregating the best content, and people have come to rely on that. So now what you have is you have a bunch of people coming to your YouTube page. When you do have your own content, you have a bunch of people who's seeing your YouTube page. If enough people are looking at your YouTube page, chances are some one of them, some of them will say, you know what, I like what they're doing online. I want to go see them in person. You can reach far more people than you can just doing this offline. And if we're talking about mainline denominations and their decline, clearly we all need to do more to get more people in the pews. Yes? Excuse me, I have a question. Is everything on YouTube available free, or is it copyrighted at all, or do you have to ever worry about that? Um, if you're simply, if, if, you're, if you are, a lot of it is copyrighted. If you are trying to use it as your own content, you can't do that. But in terms of adding it to your playlist, that's fine. Because you're actually promoting their video. Okay. You know, because they'll see who the video comes from. Oh. It's attributed by, it, the YouTube system attributes it itself. So it's simply, I saw your video, I added it to my, my site. So people can come to my site and they can see, you know, some of the cutest cat videos. And you had an adorable cat video. And, and so Cat Lady 456 had this video and I liked it. I loved it. And people came and they see this video and it's attributed to Cat Lady 456. Right? Is there a Are you limited page? to what you would want to I see you have jabred.com. Right. Are you limited to what you would want to post or call yourself if you're gonna do a, such a, a network website? No, you can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. Uh -huh. Whatever y'all agree to. Provided that the URL is available. Right, provided, yeah, provided the URL is available. Okay. And, and, then, and then what happens is you may have to get creative with the URL. Right, right. Okay. And um, if you see on the last slide, I put together a step-by-step a -step guide mm -hmm. for how to do this, how to set up your accounts. I'll walk you through how to set up your accounts, how to open your accounts, how to go on and add friends. I have some strategies on how to build friends in there. Um, where do you go to find friends? And nobody wants to, a lot of people don't want to start a Facebook page because they don't want to be that person that got like five friends and they, and they broadcast to the world that they don't have any friends. So you're going to go cry in the virtual corner. <laughs> nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms. And so, you know, I put this together so you don't have to eat any virtual worms, all right? You can, it's, it's very easy to find friends. Um, as a, for instance, you know, as for, of course, when you sign up, most of these things will connect to your email address if you let them. And they'll go through and look at your email contacts and see who's already there, right? And other things as far as associations, as far as groups that you may be in. For instance, we're in the Diocese of Central Florida. The Diocese of Central Florida has a fan page. If you look at the Diocese of Central Florida page, you'll see people that are fans, and you'll say, oh, I know this person, click. I know that person, click. And so in that guide, I put together some, some strategies for how to find friends, how to find followers, so on and so forth. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as a church Facebook page, how do you structure who actually manages that page and how, I mean, do you as the priest do all of it or do you, can you have multiple people that 
add the content that you want on there? Wonderful question. Some people may say otherwise, but I say for myself and for St. John the Baptist, I do not want to control our social media. I don't want to do it. It's got to be everybody else. And we worry a lot about protecting the institution, so on and so forth. And we get scared to do things and say things because of what might happen or whatever. But we got we to gotta be whatever. You know? what, what in the world can you possibly say that's going to destroy the church, right? I mean, <laughs> and to that point, you can have multiple admin. Right, exactly. Uh, you, you can allow multiple people to have admin to capabilities. This, you do not want it to rest upon one person. Here's why. Social media is about interactivity. It's about in the moment. If you have to have a committee that then has a vote and then passes it to the rector and then the rector has to get back to you, by the time all of that happens, the moment is gone. And you're talking about what we say yesterday is news? And so what... What's the point? Then, then you become one of those churches. You know, it's always weird to me, and we just started ours, so it's understandable, but it's always weird to me when I see institutions or whatever that have less fans than an individual. But that's because of how you look at your Facebook page, and it becomes a static environment. And why would I want to like that? Why would I follow that? Right? So to me, forget about the control. If somebody says something that's completely heinous, then the rector steps in and says issues of retraction. You know, in the, in the name of Christ and in the gospel, I retract this statement. That wasn't what we meant to say. Uh, please forgive us. You know, but don't worry about controlling it. Designate a team of people to, 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 to monitor that and to respond to that and give them, empower them to respond to that. Yes? For me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, along that line, okay, like on Facebook, like I like NBC Olympics and stuff like that. So then you go on their their page, you know, you click on one of the pictures, and a lot of stuff gets really irrelevant, you know. So I think, like with the church, like if they get off on a tangent that's like totally irrelevant to anything that the church has to do in their thing, um, you know, it was. Like I said, when I went on the Olympics thing, it was like just kind of little weird nitpicky things, you know, okay. or something. Is that the blocking um, part? The <laughs> Is that the blocking yeah, part? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. You can remove stuff. If you need to issue a retraction, issue a retraction. If you need to remove something, remove it. Yeah, so you would need somebody to kind of... Yeah, the administrator. Yeah, the, the administrator. Yeah. That's why I say you designate some administrators, and if something is there, for one thing, when we talk about irrelevant, where, where is it that the church should not be? Yeah, but like, okay, sometimes they, sometimes you read people's Facebook, I mean, if you've been on Facebook for any amount of time, yes. sometimes people, yeah, were, use words there that are yeah, inappropriate, and then, you know, it shouldn't be on a church website, I wouldn't think. You Take know. them off and block them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you just remove the content, remove yeah. the posts. Yeah, I mean, you're 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 using but, you block that person from but, yeah. but you know, here, here, here's the other thing. Hopefully, you wouldn't have somebody that you've designated a, an administrator that that lacks the the common sense to pull, to be responsible. One, two. If you're engaging, if you're talking about a fan of some sort that's posting something, mm -hmm. what happens when a when a person comes off the street and, and is inappropriate? Do we just kick them out and block them? So why block them from your fan page because they dropped the next bomb? Somebody may walk into your church one Sunday and say, I can't stand this shit. What you going to say? You can't come in here no more? I hope not. So hopefully we won't do that to them on, on Facebook as well. Because yeah. thanks be to God, they felt comfortable enough to come express their true feelings on your page. There are some search engines that go around and drop things <laughs> in Facebook. Well, yeah, and that's spam that's stuff. Yeah, that's, that's spam that's stuff that's trying to get advertisements in or something like, thing, like that. Kind of thing going on. Right. You block them. That's yeah, that's you, that, you, you, that, yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff, you block it. If it happens, yeah. you know, somebody's dropping an ad trying to, you know, take people to a site or something like that. Yeah. You, you, 
you block that kind of stuff. But you know, as people are coming in there, you know, it it, it, it is pointless to have a fan page because again, fan pages are about interaction. It's pointless to have a fan page that people cannot interact with, or that's all just positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, question. Well, I was just going to say we've only blocked two people on our uh, diocesan group right. page. Okay. Yeah, I made uh, Sue Shannon an administrator, and she's always online. If you all know her, mm -hmm. and um, keeps a good watch and has got a good even hand with the people. So, yeah. okay. and we think that one of the people we had to block, she had to block with um, their account was probably hacked. So it wasn't yeah. the individual, it was someone, some third party that was the cause of the objectionable material. Right. Oh, okay. So it doesn't happen that often. It's not like, you know, it's like our passwords on our diocesan site. We say, uh, you know, realistically, in 10 years of the site, we haven't had somebody come in and steal our stuff, you know. <laughs> we haven't had Anonymous come in and, and take all our goodies, you know, and change our stuff around. Nobody is hacked into our account. So it's rare. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I had a question about, uh, and this is just me with my lack of knowledge. I don't go on Facebook, as you know. But for, uh, I mean, you yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you know that's my goal. <laughs> I'm here. But, um, you know, as far as uh, you were saying about updating it um, once a week. So. Um, the person who managing our Facebook page would be like it's a daily expectation. I mean, you what know, this, you well, well, we have to get us outside of these boxes, mm -hmm. right? Not expectations. Mm -hmm. I don't have any expectation for myself as far as how many times I'm going to post and what. The, if something comes to me, I post it. If something doesn't come to me, I don't post it. Mm -hmm. But that that means that it's authentic. You know, because if people know, if, if you start using a tool like Facebook or Twitter or something on a schedule, people know it's contrived, oh. it's inauthentic. Interesting. What am I doing that for? You were looking for, the, again, it is online, but you're looking to be authentic. You're, you're, you are extending yourself. You're, it is an extension of who you are really. All right? Yeah, we talked about tell the truth. Yeah, the truth. exactly. So we want to be... We want to have authentic engagement. So whoever is in your church, whoever is whoever is is posting on your behalf, on behalf of the church, something comes to mind that you know the church would say. You know, something that is in the life of the church. Like you have a church that is big on social justice. Of course, something happens. You see something, you post it. You don't see something, you don't post it. You know, but that there is a concerted effort that. I will be posting as it comes to me, right? And making it meaningful. Exactly, and making it meaningful. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to know what it's like. Yes. So, you got another question? No, no. Um, what about blogs? I mean, I hear a lot about people having blogs. Have mm -hmm. you ever used oh, yeah. blogs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I blog. I, I do blog. Um, and, and, and blogs are wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Blogs are great. I'm not about to say anything bad about blogs. Okay. Um, blogs are more controlled. Mm -hmm. um, Blogs, you do take time. Blogs, you can't have a schedule, you know? So blogs, it's, it's good to have a schedule, right? Where I will post once a week, twice a week, whatever, on my blog, because that's like, that's like a newsletter. That's like a, a, a magazine. That's something that people can come to rely on, that on Sundays or on Mondays or on Tuesdays, this blog will have new content, right? Social media is, 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 is different. You know, social media you ultimately can drive things to your blog, right? You want to ultimately drive people to your site with social media. So in the midst of being interactive, and this is why it's important in social media to be interactive, because if all you ever see from me are posts about come to my website, come to my website, come to my church, come to my church, you tune out. But if I'm engaged in the community and I'm engaged in you and I see your things and I comment on your things and I see your messages and I post to your messages and I'm posting your messages and sharing your messages and then you see the come to my blog, you're more inclined to come to my blog than if that's all I ask of you. Right? Yeah. So blogging is good and you should have a blog. Blogging is more static. Um, and blogging should have a schedule. Blogging, you could have a committee established to decide who's going to post what, how regular they're going to post. Maybe this week you'll have a post from 
the chair of the youth division. Maybe next week you'll have a post from um, the worship team, or you'll have a post from the priest, or you, and you can you can organize that, right? Because you can set a schedule to that, right? That can be mechanical, yeah. right? But with social media, you don't want it to be mechanical. You want it to be organic. Authentic. I like we send out weekly reminders. That could go on the blog, too, couldn't it? Well, we, in what sense do you mean weekly reminders? Like what our church is going to do for the week. And usually it goes out on Facebook and MailChimp. MailChimp. Yeah, I was just about to say, that's, your new, that's for your newsletter. That's, that's, for your, that's for your email blast. You know, send out your email blast if you're just sending a reminder. You know, hopefully, you can post your email blast and your reminders or whatever to your Facebook and stuff like that. But again, if that's all you're doing on Facebook, <laughs> it's going to be ineffective. Yeah. If it's interspersed between organic engagement, authentic engagement, then um, those public service announcements will, will do better. You speak a language that says you've done study on this. Where does one go to study this stuff? You know, a lot of this you study late night, burning the, burning both ends of the candlestick. You know, trying to figure it out. So it's, I mean, it's mostly just practice on your part. It's not actually reading, you know, you know, the theology of social media kind of stuff. Well, no, you know, you, you, there's a whole bunch of articles out there about stuff like this and how you can do this. You know, um, what. What, what you're getting, what I hope you're getting in this presentation is a product of a lot of the work that I've done, you know, so that you don't have to um, do all of it. Because if, it, if you do, it's a daunting task. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's years to figure out how to put it all together when, you don't, when, you, when you're at the throes of it and the ground floor of it. You know, you're, you're learning these tools while they're learning how to make them, you know. And so then you go and fortunately those of us who wait until they figure it out. Like I've never, I never used to update the software on my iPhone until the software <laughs> update had been out for a month, and everybody else who, who downloaded it right away was the ones who experienced all the bugs and all the headaches and helped Apple figure out how to improve the update. Then I go and update my phone. <laughs> right? That's that's this. You know, I went through all of this, had the bumps on my head and the bruises, and trying to figure it out and so on and so forth. And you all didn't get involved, and now you're sitting here and it's like, okay, here. You know, it's been updated. <laughs> yes, sir. How long a day or how often, uh, how much time a day or how much time a week do you spend doing this? You know, I can't even, I can't even encapsulate that because I have a lot of this on my phone. Mm -hmm. And so, as a matter, when I leave here, I can rest assured, when I leave here, I will look at my phone, I will see that I have a notification on Facebook, I will go on Facebook through the app, and I'll take two seconds to respond or to engage or to whatever, and that'll be that. So it's two seconds here, it's five seconds there. You know, uh, when I talk to you in the guide for about building friends, a lot of that stuff is done by comatose. You know, you can be sitting and watching the game or something like that and you're just engaging <laughs> or whatever. And um, so you'll spend maybe maybe 10 minutes a day here, there, everywhere. Not if you're blogging or no, blo <laughs> blo blogging, no. Blogging is dedicated time. Blogging is dedicated time. Twitter doesn't take any time. Twitter doesn't take any time. I, you know, I, I'll see something crazy happen. I'll be driving on the road. I'll see something crazy happen. I'll stop at the light. When I'm stopped at the light, I'll say, send. Before the light changes, I'm done. Okay, what happens to those thousand people tweet back? You know, you respond as you can. <laughs> you're trying to <laughs> no, not while you're driving. Not while you're driving. Not, not while you're driving. I do not. I do not endorse that. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I know I shared this with you, um, Father Jabril, is that it's when you when you have a life that you've structured around your time on the computer and your time, um, you know, to do your errands and your time to do, you wonder. How do people sit there and put all this stuff on their Facebook? Now, I appreciate your response, how, you know, once you have it, like the app on your phone, right. as well as your iPad, that is what helps. Because that's what makes a difference for me with email. Once my iPhone got synced <laughs> to the email on my computer, it made a world of difference. I can now keep up with it yeah. a and, lot better and than that's I had to... You know, boot up the computer. That's what these softwares stuff. will do. Once you do it, <laughs> once you get online with Facebook or whatever, and then you get online with Twitter or YouTube or whatever, it'll even ask you, do you want to link this with your Twitter account? Do you want to link this to Facebook? Yeah. 
And it's simple. You click yes and whatever, and you can you can interface with both of them. You can post your tweets to to your to your Facebook or post your Facebook to your Twitter. Um, I don't because I'm, if 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 everything on my Twitter is the same as what you get on my Facebook. Well, I do. You know, so I have different content on my Twitter than what you'll find on my Facebook. Sometimes I'll go through and post the same thing because I want both groups to see. But sometimes, you know, there's stuff that only gets on my Twitter or stuff that only gets on my Facebook. Right. Personal question. Yeah. Um, I work a lot with college guys. Have a, a kid, absolutely antithetical, not Christian, but I pulled a thorn out of his paw, so he thinks I'm okay. And his Twitter stuff is so inappropriate, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but he knows, you know, they'll read it from time to time because they'll tap back, you know. Right. And you got a theology on that, you know. Um, there's, there's times I read his stuff kind of like this, you know. That, <laughs> you know, the, 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 what, what the wristband say? What the wristband say? What would Jesus do? Yeah. Um, we got to remember, and I was telling somebody on Facebook, there was a Facebook discussion just the other day, that um, we all have these nostalgic images of Jesus. We forget who Jesus was and who Jesus hung around and who Jesus engaged with. Um, and we think that, you know, I don't know what we, what, what we remember of Jesus, right? So you find those spaces, because even in the midst of the murk and the mud, there is something that is redeemable. And so you find those spaces where you can see that redemption, and that's where you dive in. Okay. It doesn't, but his Twitter's don't take my Twitter's to somebody else's Twitter saying that I'm yeah, thinking like he's yeah, thinking, yeah. right? Even if, even if you retweet his stuff, ever. But even if you retweet it, <laughs> even if you even if you retweet it, like I've shared stuff that I don't agree with. You know, I've shared stuff that I don't agree with. Clearly stating that I don't agree with it. Okay. But I have shared stuff that I don't agree with. Because what, what do we do in real life? Do we just say, oh, I don't, I hope, you know, we do do this. We just say, I don't agree with you, so go your way and I go mine, and we never come together again, which is wrong. Because our gospel calls for reconciliation, which means that people who disagree should still be able to live together in unity. So hopefully, you know, just because I disagree with you on your post doesn't mean that I have to unfriend you. You know, or that I have to disassociate with you. And if somebody comes back, I can still defend you even though I disagree with the, the tweet. Look, he's a human being. He has the right to say what he wants to say. I don't agree, but I'm not going to cut him off just because he said it. And then you even pull another thorn out of his paw because he sees that when everybody else ostracizes him because of what he says, here's somebody that even though he doesn't agree with me, he still embraces me. Who sometimes says, dude, you know your priest friend is reading this? Right, right, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, sometimes, and I respond to stuff that I, that I don't agree with, with, with hashtag in Jesus' name. <laughs> I like that. That's true. Or, or hashtag glory, hallelujah. You know? <laughs> Somebody else had something over here? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say about the workflow and the integrating of the different pieces. It depends on your circumstances and what you're trying to do. So at the diocese, I put up uh, two, two or three little videos every week. And I have YouTube set up so that that sends out to our Twitter feed. And the Twitter feed sends to our uh, Facebook page. And the Facebook page feed posts to the front of our website. Mm -hmm. So I only have to post once. Now that's the YouTube. Aside from that, so that we don't just make things look automatic, independent of that, we Twitter and we put stuff up on our Facebook page. Right. But that's one way to get things so that you're not spending all day doing, you know, repeating your work. There is a way to make the, you know, make a domino effect and make it cascade out from one posting to your other yeah, you make entities. It work for you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You have to figure out what what makes sense for you under your circumstances. And, you know, a, 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 a good way, speaking on your website and blog and stuff like that, a good way to help you facilitate that is get off of those other static website stuff and build your site on a WordPress model. Because <laughs> WordPress, you can do all sorts of plugins and everything else that integrate all of this stuff for you. With your static websites that you might get from somebody and spend an arm and a leg for somebody to build and 
and spend another arm and a leg to somebody to monitor a WordPress site you can build for little or nothing and you can go in the back end yourself and, and monitor it and it's very easy, it's very user friendly. The WordPress, W-O-R-D-P-R-E-S-S, -S, I moved our site over to okay. WordPress. Yeah. And <laughs> Uh, I'm also using Wix, Wix is very powerful. Wix is too. It's got a lot of, uh, it's pretty much all drag and drop, it takes very little effort to build on it, and they've got some wonderful templates that, um, and it's not hard to change them up. You can switch them up so that it fits the, the message of your church. Okay, and Wix is W-I-X. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And so, don't make your homepage an ad. Right. Get some content on there. Exactly. Give them a reason to come back and look. Exactly, and so for instance, with my, I can tell you I post my sermons every Sunday, I record my sermons and I post them online, so. Oh, well, that was cool. Thank you. Jabril, how do you, how do you link to your sermons? Do you write a tease for your sermon to draw them into it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so when I, I, I do a blog article, that, that is, I say things that are not said in my sermon, but I poke provocative thought out of my, out of, out of my sermon, um, and like for instance, I did a, I did my sermon on, on reconciliation this past Sunday and uh, around the commune, about the Eucharist. And the title of the sermon was The Lord's Supper Has No Power. But the um, title of the blog post was Communion is a Waste of Time. <laughs> and, um, and then from there, I even teased it on other networks. Why would a priest say that communion is a waste of time? You know, or a priest just said that communion is a waste of time. You know? And so. But when I post to, from, from my blog, my blog then posts to Twitter, it posts to YouTube, it posts to, to Facebook, it posts to LinkedIn, it posts to Google+, it posts to a couple other ones. And just because I use WordPress and those plugins. Do you hand type in your blog sermon every week? How do you get that content? Uh, the, the blog, yeah, I hand type the blog, but the blog is not the sermon. Yeah. The blog is just the blog. Just the sermon the is an audio file that I convert to a, I convert to a video. So in converting my audio to a video, I just slap a picture behind it so I can upload it to YouTube. Okay. Yeah. And then I write something, 300 to 500 words, somewhere in there. Um, it's got to be at least 300 because that's what SEO looks for, search engine optimization looks for. Um, so it's 300 to 500, long enough to be picked up on the website, on, the, on Google, but short enough where people don't have to read all day um, and go from there. And you do that every week? Yeah. That, when we talk about scheduling, yeah, that's that's it, that is my schedule. Sunday after I get home from church, I may, I may rest for a little bit, but then I go to work on editing the audio file and putting that together and uploading it and writing the blog post so that by Sunday evening, my sermon is posted. Great.